Vincent Price presents Morris Denham and Liz Fraser in The Family Album by William Ingram. Vincent Price. Hello and welcome. Meet my friend Arthur, Arthur Goodby. Arthur is your ordinary, very ordinary, ordinary man. The kind of man one simply passes in the street. The kind of man at a ticket barrier one squeezes past and perhaps ever so gently curses at. <laughs> Such a man is Arthur Goodby. Only a few very intimates are even aware of his existence. And yet, in his home life, even this ordinary, very ordinary, ordinary man has his hidden depths. Depths too deep to fathom. Well... To my man's liking, was it? First class. Hope you haven't robbed your Arthur, though. You let me worry about my Arthur. Well, say thank you nicely, then. Oh, I just did. Nicely was what I said. Rose. Oh, see? Right back, is it? Oh, don't start, Rose. Should have known what I was letting myself in for right from the start. Oh, everything in the garden when you first moved in here. Uh, your invitation. At Arthur's invitation. Poor, simple, good-natured Arthur, eh? Rose, meet my good friend Harry, one of the very best, but presently without a roof over his head, and with that spare room of ours just collecting cobwebs. Well, I was very grateful to Arthur. I bet you were. But I wonder how grateful Arthur would be if it ever got out that that spare room wasn't the only thing that took his young friend's fancy. What? He may seem simple, but I shouldn't count on his good nature running to that extent. You wouldn't dare. Who said anything about daring? <laughs> Not a word from these lips, I should hope. Not a single little word. Oh, he could walk through that door any minute. Oh, not a chance. Oh, for God's sake. Friday night, isn't it? So? So, always an hour later of a Friday. His usual little stop-off, it is, Mr. Martin. Oh, I was forgetting. <laughs> creature of habit, my Arthur. <laughs> Thank God for creatures of habit. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Mr. Martin? Oh. Are you there? Anyone at home? Come in. Come, come in. Ah, oh, there you are, my good friend. Yeah, I hope it's not inconvenient. No, no. I have just about given you up, though. Oh, the rush hour, I'm afraid, even worse than usual. You, you're a lucky man not to know it first hand. Oh, I am. I know I am. Just me and my shop, and as many beautiful reminders of the past as I can afford to lay my hands on. Mm. And I know which particular beauty brought you visiting. You spotted it in the window, eh? Yes, but the reserve tag is... Uh... you, my good friend, who else? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> who else? But my good friend, Mr. Goodby, shall have first refusal. Well, that's very kind. <gasps> Let me show you. A large country house sale this very morning. And though I say to myself, as fine a family album as you've ever likely to see. <laughs> well... A beauty, eh? Ah, beautiful. You feel the weight. Hmm? Yeah. Ah, yes. Real gilt lettering on the hand tooth leather. Mm, family album. <laughs> Raftsmanship, eh? You see the solid brass cloth? Yes. Yeah. That's to keep out the nosy body intruders. Oh, well, oh, may I look inside? <laughs> ah, for you, I think I can make the exception. Oh, the family album of William James Willoughby. And so it's only fitting his photograph should have pride of place. Yes, how proud he looks. Mm. I ain't figured of a man, eh? Dressed for the hunt. Understand? Shotgun, crooked in his arm. Yeah, like he'd put a bully to do anybody that dared to venture further. <laughs> oh. And then, just empty pages. Yeah, Seems those nosy body intruders got their way after all. As you say. Well, well <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> Just what you'd set your heart on for so long. Oh, certainly that. Your turn, knock down, Price. Oh, oh well, that's very good of you. But... I tell you what. 
I take it with you now and work out what you think it's worth. And then drop the money in next time you're passing. Well, if you're sure... No trust between old friends. No trust at all. Besides, high time to put the shutters up. And your lovely wife at home waiting your return. Dinner waiting to be served. Slippers by the hearth. If you'll allow an old bachelor the liberty of saying so... <laughs> A man to be envied. Oh, yes, Mr. Martin. <laughs> I suppose most people would consider me a very lucky man. Good night. Yes, yeah, well, I think he's very nice, Arthur. <laughs> Something, well, uh, well, a bit different. Know what I mean? Leave it, Harry, for God's sake. Makes enough of an idiot of himself without you trying to put him in the right. Sorry? Talk about a load of rubbish. Well, I just took a fancy to it. I bet you did. No wonder old Martin keeps that junk shop of his open every Friday night till God knows what hour. Bet his face lights up every time his shop bell tings. Oh, I never quite considered it in that light, dear. Considered? <laughs> considered is the last thing that comes into it from where I'm standing. Passes your plate. Mm. I, uh, I suppose I could always take it back. You can do what you ruddy really like, Sonny Jim. Either that or it's down that shed with the rest of the rubbish. One thing's for sure, you're not catching me giving it house room. I see. It is a lovely bit of craftsmanship, Rose. And the last thing I need is you ganging up on me. Oh, it's just remarkable. Then don't. Morbid is what I call it. Family album. But minus the family, it would seem. Ah, well, uh, I had thought, uh, well... We could always start taking some of our own. <laughs> oh, no. Not watch the birdie time again. Do you know, Harry, last time he tried that caper, he spent a fortune on snaps that either didn't turn out or looked as if they'd been taken down the wrong end of a telescope. Morbid is what I call it. My final word on the matter. Well, if you've quite finished, I'll make a start with the washing up. So I'll give you hands. As you like. Uh, no, no, um, not, not yet. No. Uh, something, um, I've got something to tell you. Not too surprises in one night. You know Harry's got a weak heart, he'll never stand it. Go on then, Arthur. Well, I've got me a, well, <laughs> that, that's to say, I, I, I've got us a car. A car? Mm. <laughs> oh, I don't believe it, I honestly don't. A car, Arthur, but, no, nothing special, uh, not new, but... Not that old, neither. Oh, yeah? Yeah, just a little runabout. <laughs> but you can't even drive, Arthur. Drive? The old fool's as blind as a bat. Have us up the nearest tree before we got as far as the corner. Harry can, though. Me? Well, you want me to go along with you? Well, yes, Harry, of course. Did you think different? Now, trips, you see, trips. Just the three of us, a regular family outing, eh? Oh, yes. Yeah. I'm sure we'd all enjoy that. And Arthur was right about that. Though they must have appeared a somewhat odd threesome. Poor Arthur, relegated to the back seat, Rose, head scarved and bubbling up front, and young Harry at the wheel, showing off a bit like any kid on the fairground bumpers. <laughs> young Harry. But quite old enough to know better. Oh, it all seemed a very civilized arrangement in theory, anyway the most cordial of relationships, with Rose always at the center, a feeling of sharing, each after their fashion, some prized possession. They never referred to it directly, of course. Nothing is blunt. It was enough to bask in the secret knowledge of it, like the sun and the sea on that warm summer's day. Arthur, she's waving. What? Uh, well, Rose... Look, did he spot her? Uh, no, I can't say. I, uh... here, here, have a go with the glasses. Oh. No, 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 no. More to the right. Mm. Hey, she must be halfway to the point, for God's sake. Ah, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so she is. She's waving. Well, wave back then. She'll expect you to wave back. <laughs> uh, that's right. Uh, coffee? I'm oh, sorry. What the hell did she want to go all that way for? Out of her depths, eh? <laughs> Quite right, young Harry. You should never get out of your depth. Anyway, panic over. She's swimming back now. Oh, thank God for that. Uh, worries, were we? Oh, you must never worry, Harry. 
Not as far as my road is concerned. Never pays to worry. <laughs> well, if you say so. Oh, I do, I do. Well, should know her by now, I should hope. Should know my own wife by now, eh? <laughs> After so many years. Ten, as a matter of fact. Anyway, you must know pretty well all there is to know about Rose and me by now. Well, <laughs> mm, ups and downs, young Harry. The difference in age? Bound to happen, wouldn't you say? Well, if you say so. I oh, think. I do, I do. You take my word for it. <laughs> Still, knew what I was letting myself in for when I popped the question. <laughs> oh, she took a bit of persuading, I can tell you. Well, if you look at it from Rosie's point of view, not much on offer. Hmm? Not much to write home about, as the saying goes. <laughs> Comfortable little nest egg in the bank, regular job. Prospects, even. Hmm. If I played my cards right, eh? But never a great one for card playing, young Harry. <laughs> Not enough skill, a bit short on deception. Now, much better stick to your limits. Leave the high stakes for them that can afford them, eh? Mm. Wouldn't you agree, young Harry? Oh, uh... Oh, oh tuck us a towel, one of you, I'm thrown. Oh, oh, that's my hey, old oh. rose bag. Oh. <laughs> Quite the mermaid, eh? I hope you haven't seen all the coffee off. We'll pour it for her, will you, Harry? I'd like to get a snapshot when she thinks we're not looking. <laughs> Lovely when you get in. God only knows what state my hair's going to be in. Rose here, watch the birdie. Uh, <laughs> got you. Oh, ruddy hell. That's another one for that damned family album. And another for the album it was. There were many, many more other ones. Rose sometimes prinking and preening straight into the lens, sometimes deliberately pouting away from the shutter. Harry beside her, his expression seldom changing, pleasant but set, resigned. Almost part of the furniture. As for Arthur, Arthur clicked away quite merrily, regardless of mood or circumstance. But the surprising thing was, he never showed them the results. If badgered, he'd just shrug it off and smile. Patience, patience. When the great day dawns and my album is complete, you shall be the first invited to its unveiling. In the weeks that followed, Arthur's shed became a kind of refuge. This increasing absence from hearth and home, if noted at all, caused neither concern or comment. It was as he wanted it. Is Rose with you? Oh, no, no, she's up at the house. Raising out about our supper's getting cold. Arthur? No, oh, just a minute. I'll let you in. <laughs> Lord, talk about the Bank of England. Well, just in case the uh, vandals. Yeah. So, what particular interest kept you burning the midnight oil tonight? No, nothing in particular. I would just... Oh, no, no, no. No need to explain, old mate. See for myself. Well, well. Another session on the old family album, eh? <laughs> Catch it up on the rogues gallery. Anywhere near publication date, are we? How about a bit of a preview, eh? I'd rather you didn't. Oh, just a little peek. No, please. Oh, be a sport. Not a word to Rose, promise. Mm. Well... As you please. Well? Well, indeed. Yeah, I did warn you they weren't. You see, you're still letting Squire William James Willoughby keep his pride of place at the front. It is his album. Was? Seems a pity to disturb it. Oh, as you say, as you say. Well? Oh, gets better as you go on. But, well, uh, got to admit, made a bit of a botch of these early ones, Arthur, mate. Uh, double exposure. No. Well, it's something to do with the printing. <laughs> if I were you... I developed them myself. <laughs> <laughs> Could explain it. <laughs> no offence. Look closer. Touch it. Ooh. Yes. Take your point. Unpleasant. A bit like uh, fungus. Yeah, fungus. Hmm. But only on these early ones, eh? So far. Hmm. You, uh, keep me up here. 
on this shelf, do you? And just where you're looking. Oh, it explains it then, doesn't it? You got damp up there, after all, mate. Damp? But now, wrap it in newspaper, tuck it away in a cupboard. That should do the trick. You really think so? Sure so. <laughs> Harry! <sighs> Arthur! Where the devil have you both got to? Just coming! Oh, Harry, huh? no need to let Rose in on all this. It's still supposed to come as a nice surprise. <laughs> Mum's the word, old mate. Mum is the word. Thank you. The last little outing they ever took was a visit to a bird sanctuary. As a matter of fact, it was Arthur's idea. Though it seemed an obvious choice. Besides, the seclusion of the place was bound to have its advantages. Daffy old Arthur could plod off with his government surplus binoculars to spy on his feathered friends, leaving her with Harry. And more personal intimacy. It preoccupied them. In fact, it wasn't until early evening they began to think something might be up. Well, Your Honor, we called and called for him, but no joy. Joy? Uh, results, Your Honor. This is a coroner's inquiry, Mr. Blake, not a court of law. Your Honor? Sir, will suffice. Oh, yes, sir. So then what did you do? Well, we thought Arthur, uh, Mr. Goodby... Uh, might be playing a lark on us at first. A lark? Well, just at first. And then we went looking, didn't we? As our God knows, uh, heaven knows, uh, what chance we thought we had. I mean, all that undergrowth, reeds, not to mention the lake. You could find no trace, though. Uh, no, sir. No sight, no sound out of the ordinary? Nothing at all. Except for... For what? <laughs> Gunshot. One right after the other. A double barrel shotgun. Are you sure of that? Oh, not sure. Far from it. It's just the way it sounded. But as Rose, uh, Mrs. Goodby said, not very likely. Oh? Well, it's not the kind of thing you'd expect to hear in a bird sanctuary, is it? N not the kind of thing at all. Well, please continue. <sighs> nothing else. <sighs> By then it was nearly dark. Oh, There's nothing more we could do on our own. So we got to the nearest telephone and, and called the police. You may return to your seat, Your Honour. <clears throat> Therefore, having given due and careful consideration to the evidence concerning the sudden, unexplained disappearance of the said Arthur William Goodby, and in view of the fact that no remains had ever been recovered, or evidence to suggest intent or willful act of malice, I shall herewith return an open verdict, but not totally dismissing the inherent possibility of death by misadventure. This coroner's court is adjourned. Poor tragic Rose. But, dear listener, I'm sure you can well imagine the scene. The most wonderful of husbands in the whole wide world. Yes, Rose. Nothing I wouldn't have done for my Arthur. You know that. Of course, Rose. He'll have left me the lot, of course, you'll see. <laughs> Nothing but the very best for my Rose. A number of times I've heard him say that. And now that he's gone, stands to reason. Well, great expectations, time. Eh, Harry, love? <laughs> great expectations. <laughs> But the mutual expectations proved short-lived. Rose was right about copying the lot, of course, but she certainly hadn't bargained on a recent hefty mortgage Arthur had saddled her with. His bank account also seemed to indicate dear deceased Arthur had treated himself to something of a spree in his latter years. The ruddy, hey-timing... Oh, really been doing himself proud, hasn't he? Know what? He probably had some fancy woman chucked away under my very nose. Arthur, come off it, love. How the hell would we know? Explain why he was always back late every Friday, wouldn't it? Splashing out on some damn tart while dear darling Rose held the fault. And found whatever fault bit of consolation she could. What? Uh, nothing. Nothing that matters. But it did. 
Amazing how Rose's change of circumstances affected Harry. His little treats, the odd preze, became fewer and fewer. It eventually got so bad, she even suggested he get himself a job and help out with the housekeeping. The writing certainly seemed on the wall. What Arthur had spent the loot on continued to puzzle him, though. The secret affair Rose credited him with? High in the sky. There'd be no sudden change in lifestyle, so where the hell? Then it dawned on him. The shed. The stuff in the shed. They'd seen bits and pieces, but for all anybody knew, they could be sitting on a fortune. But why they? It didn't take Harry long to drop the plural notion of things. Well, he'd earned it, hadn't he? Had it coming to him, didn't he? His chance came a couple of nights later. The night of the storm. Such a storm. There'd been nothing like it since the night he'd barged in on Arthur in the garden shed. It was the memory of that night that took Harry to the living room window now. And as he peered through into the night, he saw it. A light on. Down there. In the shed, slanting through the dirty panes onto the lawn. And even at this distance, Harry could see the door was ajar, almost invitingly ajar. It could be he'd underestimated Rose. Perhaps she had come to the same conclusion as he had, was down there now, taking stock, making plans, about to leave him high and dry. Arthur's work table. The family album. It drew Harry to it like a magnet. Oh, my God. My dear, dear God. Open at the first page. And the eyes of the original owner, long dead but caught forever, staring out at him. The eyes of the dead straight from the grave, staring out at him from a slime of maggot-ridden putrescence. And from those eyes, a fungus-like growth, smearing itself, obliterating the snapshot images of those strangers who had dared to invade the rest of its pages. Harry and Rose at the seaside. Harry and Rose at Picnic, Winter Castle. Harry and Rose. Harry and Rose at the bird. At the bird sanctuary? But how? I mean, that very last day, but how? They never even found his damn camera. So how the hell? It was the click that made Harry freeze. The unmistakable double click of a shotgun being cocked. In the age it took him to turn, he saw the thing that had once been a man. Slowly raising the gun now, staring down the sights at him. A man in an old-fashioned hunting costume, Norfolk jacket and trousers tucked into gaiters. That dead socket of an eye staring down the sights at him. A dribbling mouth, the cheekbones thrusting through the gray parchment of putrefied flesh. Oh, no. There was no mistaking the album's original owner. William James Willoughby! No! <laughs> no! In the name of Jesus! No! It was as far as Harry got. His heart beat now like some great animal trapped in his chest 
a great insurmountable sea pounding, roaring through him, and finally dragging him down, ever down, into his unknown depth. Then it was over. He lay quite still, done, all done. Arthur waited a full minute to be sure before he lowered the gun and removed the mask. And the figure that now knelt beside his dead friend's body bore no resemblance to that mottled harlequin of death. I'm glad you didn't make me pull the trigger, Harry. Anyway, I, I doubt if I could have found it in me. But the album, the mask, quite works of art, wouldn't you say? No violence in me, though. No real violence. Not against you, dear friend. Not against Rose. Not even when I was forced to watch the two of you together. Me? Always cast in the role of poor old Arthur, eh? So gullible. So naive. So easy to trick. Until that day at the sanctuary... <laughs> oh, poor, poor Harry. Arthur climbed over the garden fence and took a short cut over the field. He buried his grotesque mask and period costume in a carefully prepared plot. From there, he continued on foot to a small suburban station where he took a train heading north. A very ordinary little man. One of the faceless ones. The powers that be decided Harry had suffered a heart attack, which he had. A year later, Rose found herself a new fancy man, sold the house, and moved to a different love nest. One day, the new owners will find the album, mildewed, past saving. They'll make noises of disgust, handle it with gloves. And finally burn it on a bonfire. It's of no account. It had served its purpose. That was The Family Album, starring Morris Denham as Arthur Goodby and Liz Fraser, Rose. With James Kerry as Harry, Aubrey Morris, Mr. Martin, and Anthony Newland, the coroner. The Price of Fear was presented by Vincent Price, written by William Ingram, 